afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Welcome to our event. It's good to see all of you. We're having a great summer. Weather-wise, we still got August to get through with some of the temperatures, but uh, we've been enjoying it so far, so hopefully you have too. Uh, my name is Paul Zarling. I'm the managing partner here at Client First, and I'm, I'm happy to welcome you to our event and our education event on the markets. Uh, but before I get to the speakers and introducing them, just a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, if you need more food, go ahead and get it. Uh, desserts better hurry up. Looks like that's run out over there. Uh, or drinks. Uh, restrooms in the back. And if you do want to silence your phones out of courtesy for other attendees, that'd be great. And then finally, before the, the speakers, you know we like to start these with trivia. Yes. And I know Justin's not here yet, so I'm not going to do weather trivia. Uh, I usually like to make it topical um, for the for the event that we're having. So it's gonna be related to the stock market. So here is the trivia. So you know that they ring the stock bell, right, at 9.30 Eastern, 8.30 Central, right? What was the first year they started doing that? The first year they started using a bell to ring the opening of the stock market. Any guesses? 1930. 1905. I'll say 1946. 1946. Anybody else? 1950 what? Two. This is uh, 1903. 1903. So he was uh, he's pretty close. 1905. So 1903 is when they first started using the bell to ring it. Prior to that, believe it or not, they used the Chinese gong. So that, that was a little interesting when I found that out. All right, so let's get to the speakers. Let's get to the education. So remember, you have the printouts in front of you. You have note cards. You got pens. So it's my pleasure to have... Uh, Two of our team members, uh, David Zarling, who you, a lot of you know, partner, uh, head of investment strategy research, but navigating the markets for uh, over 15 years. And then we're going to have another speaker who's coming up. Uh, some of you know him, Kevin Ferrari. He's a great story uh, for our firm. He's been with us since he's been an intern. Now he's grown, he's been with us for seven years. Now he's going to get married. He's bought a home. He's on his way to getting his own CMT designation. So we're super proud of everything he's done. He'll be coming as well. We'll also have the Q&A panel. And I'll be back to kind of close things up, okay? So that's the game plan. Get your pens ready, get your ears ready, and uh, a warm welcome for David Zarley. Thank you, Paul. Am I loud enough? Yeah. In the back, we're good? Uh, now if we could only get them to ring the bell at the market top or the market bottom, I would be extremely happy. That would be great. Um, I always have to start with the legalese that this presentation is for information purposes and education purposes. If you're not a client with us, we don't know your personal situation. So that's how this information should be received. Um, I get really excited about talking markets. I get to do this every quarter. I'm really excited for Kevin to come up here. Uh, he's a rising star at our firm. And uh, the reason why I, I enjoy it so much is it's, it's a chance to give you some information that you can use. I know some of you will take the presentation home and put it on your nightstand, you'll review it because it'll be so great. <laughs> okay. Uh, I also get excited, right, we're past Independence Day, uh, which can be a little nerve wracking because sometimes you feel like all of a sudden Christmas is here. But that's not so bad because that's another type of Independence Day, right? For me, Independence for my sin. So you get to ce celebrate, bookend your Independence Day, nothing wrong with that. But I love seeing all the summer garb, everybody nice and relaxed in their summer outfits, having some summer food. And now we'll talk markets. What are we gonna talk about? We'll talk about the math problem with buy and hold investing. We will obviously discuss the current market environment. Talk about something near and dear to our hearts currently, the US dollar and commodities since the Russian invasion of U Ukraine, because that's been one of the topics du jour is the, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, although they've kind of cooled off covering that as much. But I'm sure that there's some opinions that you've gained on what commodities should have done since Russia invaded Ukraine. Then we'll bring Kevin back up after we're done presenting and open it up for questions. That's where we would like you guys to have your note cards available uh, to ask, ask questions. I always like starting a little bit with the, my family. Uh, we had a great trip to uh, northern Wisconsin. We hiked in the Porcupine Mountains. We decided since the, the market's kind of in a waterfall that we would visit some waterfalls. Uh, that was pretty fun. And like markets, life, life has some ups and downs, some celebrations and some hardships. Uh, my daughter tore her ACL. But it's the beginning of a new chapter. It's the beginning of a, a rehab and getting stronger. 
Uh, her sister honored her by wearing her cleats for her soccer game. Uh, Eli's team won uh, regional finals, and they went on to sectional finals the first time in quite a while that that school had done that. That's him. He's running like a little kid. Uh, Micah, two, two championships, and then you got to sleep after that. That's kind of a big deal. And then I had a chance to golf with my dad and my sons and nephews, and I don't think I hit a ball straight, but it was still fun. So what are we talking about today? We're talking about it being adaptive. It is part of our true holistic process. We don't just manage money here at Client First. We put together a plan that involves estate planning and Social Security, insurance, taxes. The investment piece just as important. That's what we're going to focus on today. And our adaptive system is really about three main things. It's three main objectives. And that's outcomes of big wins, small wins, and trying to keep it to small losses. And so we're going to cover some of that today as we go through a bunch of charts. So first and foremost, though, here's an iconic picture of the Titanic sinking. <coughs> And this is my version of what buy and hold investment vesting looks like. And here's why. When we look at what happens when we have corrections, right? If we've got a 40% correction and our account is exposed to that, it takes 66% return to get back to even. So it goes back to the classic case of you don't need a parachute to go skydiving. You need it to go skydiving twice. Uh, in markets, if you buy and hold through major, major corrections, it can really impact your retirement. And so that's why we need to manage risk. For the majority of our industry, they set up their client portfolios, put them on the horse, slap it, and send it off to the sunset, and whatever happens from that point forward is what happens. We don't think that's appropriate. We can't mitigate, we can't get rid of all losses, but we can reduce them as we manage risk going forward. So as an example of this, when we look back to two other corrective periods in the market, such as the dot-com bust when I began my career uh, in the year 2000 through 2003, minus 46% market correction, took 85% to get back to even. And when you look at the data and understand, it was basically three years down and five years up. So it typically takes twice as, twice as long to recoup, and that's also a problem with buy and hold. <coughs> 2008 correction, the great financial crisis, the housing crisis, however you want to label it, minus 85%, or I'm sorry, minus 57%, which took 85% to get back to even. It took 18 months to unfold and four years to get back to even. And in retirement years, that's a lot of time. Right, going through this period in a market, 2000 to 2008 to 2013, 13 years, not bad for a 20 and 30 year old to go through and dollar cost average into, but as you get nearer to retirement and your nest egg has grown, or you're in retirement and you're starting to take withdrawals, this type of market environment really starts to impact what you're able to do retirement wise. That's why we use it. More recently, some real world example, we had a minus 35% correction during the COVID crash in March of 2020. That was the fastest from high to a low ever recorded in a market, 26 days. We were proud of the way the adaptive system operated because during this period, this was minus 35% in 26 days, our most aggressive account down minus 17, and then you have the other additional numbers here. So being able to reduce that risk. And when you do the math, so what, what is my actual return? If I'm down 17%, okay, I'm closer to the 20% range to get back to even rather than the 53% range. That's a 30% difference when we use compounding math, which is what investing is all about. So one of the narratives that tends to happen during the bear market, which we're in, is that you need to stay invested because otherwise you'll miss the best days. Okay, I'm here to tell you that's a bald faced lie because you don't get to cherry pick the best days and not look at when the worst days happen. 
Because believe it or not, a child can win the championship on a day and your daughter tear 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 a sale on the same day. So same thing in markets. You don't get to have just one or the other. And here's some data that was put together by Dorsey Wright and Associates. And they did it in celebration of the 20 year anniversary of 1984. Or I'm sorry, 1987, the correction, 1987. And what they did is they noticed, yes, you know, here's some of the best days from 1984 through 2017. All the green are some of the best days. They circled all the best days, but they also circled it with the worst days. And you'll notice that they cluster. Worst days and best days happen together. So if you're missing the best days, most likely you're also missing the worst days in the market. So to drive this point home, if we look at this data, and again, this goes through uh, December 31st, 1984 through 10, 18, 2017, 32 years. If you just buy and hold, you'd have about an 1800% return. That's great. If you miss the best 20 days, which is what the media likes to focus on, you better not miss the best days. If you did that, if somehow you were only able to remove the best days, it is true, your return would only be 484%. But we can't look at data that way. We have to take it as a whole. When we do that, and we miss the worst days, so let's say we did the inverse, the opposite. We, they took the best days out, we'll take the worst days out. You'd have an 8,500% return. But obviously we can't do that because they're connected. They're related to each other. Best days and worst days are related to each other. So when we do look at this, if we avoid the best 20 and the worst 20, we actually have a 2,600% return. So remember, buy and hold is 1,800% return. Missing the best and worst is 2,600% return. That's a pretty big difference by missing the best and worst days together. To kind of show you this on a chart, this is up through the COVID crash. The dot represents a best day, and we've taken the best days going back to the year 2000. These are the best days in the market. Does anybody notice anything about where the best days occur? When down. Yeah, when they're down in the worst markets. The best days happen in the worst markets. So whenever we see like, oh man, the market was up four or five percent, that's great, but it might not be because the best days happen in the worst markets. We've had a couple best days this year, but yet many markets are down 20 to 30 percent. So what is our current market environment like? Right? We, we know the media's finally caught on, and for some reason, minus 20% defines a bear market. We have no idea where they got that number from. We view it as downtrends versus uptrends. There's also sideways, where there is no trend. But we know that 2022 was the, if we just look at the first 132 days, trading days, it's the second worst since 1928. Okay, market down, this is using S&P, down 20%. Again, you're gonna see this on here a lot. That's for you to reference and look and see, okay, what would that take to get back to even? Second worst since 1928. When we look across beyond just the S&P 500, and we look at this top line here, which is small caps, and this goes back to February 1st, 2021, and why, if you were at some of our last presentations, the reason why we picked that is that's when the majority of stocks started to correct, is February of 2021. So really, the bear market is beyond this year. It goes all the way back to February 2021. So we're now nearing you know, 17 to 18 months of correction for the majority of stocks. So since that date, February of 2021, small caps are down 15%. Our hard, high flying names, people have gotten a ton of return out of these. You know, your IPO stocks, your initial public offering stocks, uh, ARK Invest, which is a high tech, high software type fund, um, SPACs, special acquisition vehicles. These are down 50 to 70%. And you look over in that chart and that's when things get really scary. And our clients know that we haven't owned any of that. 
we didn't own the previous high flyers <coughs> that people made 120% the prior, prior year because we could sell out of them and not be involved with them. The one thing I'd like to highlight, treasuries. Treasuries have been correcting this whole time too, down 21%. Remember, the industry says you should own more bonds. As you get older, as you get further in retirement, we disagree that you need to own more bonds. So there, there hasn't been a lot of places since February. Uh, I also provided a, uh, adaptive returns there for your reference uh, through last week from this period so you can compare these different markets and you can compare it to the chart as well. The other thing is you'll see that I've referenced a lot of indexes. So small cap index, treasuries as an index, some of the more um, high risk areas when we look at what the average portfolio has done since July of last year, so go, looking back one year, down about 34%. And the reason why I like to do this is may, maybe you're not a client with us and you felt that, but sometimes for our clients, they don't get to see what it would have been like to be somewhere else. And so this is a chance to have a little bit of humble brag in front of you that when we look at the one-year performance, looking back, same time frame for ultra growth, growth, moderate, and balance. Yes, they are down, but they're not this. And when we look at the table, we're thankful we're not that. One of the biggest things, stories of our current, and it may be a regime shift, this may be a generational shift happening, is in the bond market, is in treasuries. This is a uh, U.S. Treasury index, so this actually has a broad spectrum. It's not just some uh, specific duration, like 20 or 30 year duration. That's close to a minus 12% drawdown, and it's bigger than anything we've seen since the 70s. A lot of places, your construction of your portfolio is somewhere 50 to 70% stocks, and then the flip side, the remainder of that portfolio is bonds. During this period, the reason why this chart looks like this, the reason why the average person is down so big is because bonds haven't protected them. Everything has been down, stocks and bonds, and that's a, that's a dangerous cocktail when they go together because the industry told us they should work opposite. Well, it works opposite until it doesn't. Uh, and it's not right now. That's why we don't own bonds. We've had limited exposure to bonds. Sometimes we've even had short bonds. When we look at it, so everything I was presenting to you in the past was in percentage terms. What I have up here is dollar terms. And what we're seeing, going back all the way to 1970s, is one of the largest destructions of wealth in modern history. So to orientate you to this chart, for example, during the 0809 crisis, about minus 10 trillion was taken out from market, from owning stocks and bonds, that much. We're now minus 15. And this is related back again to what treasuries and what bonds have done during this period of time. So stocks down, bonds down, that tends to be a recipe for this type of wealth, wealth destruction. Where are we at seasonality wise? What is seasonality? So seasonality, is something that we like to study. It's basically taking what's happened in the past and seeing what it looks like in the current environment. An example of this is we know that we tend to get snow in January here in Wisconsin, right? That's, if we, if we don't get snow in January, it's not the end of the world, but if we never got snow in January, we might take notice. If we got snow in July, that would be, well, first you guys would be upset, but two, that'd be bizarre extremely abnormal what's going on so you pay attention to that when things are different what this chart is is the S&P 500 using seasonality going back to 1946 the black line is what all years for the S&P 500 have looked like on average blue line is all midterm years green line first term midterm years purple line Democratic president midterm year <coughs> red line, second year, new Dem president. So right, these purple and red lines make a lot of sense because that's where we are right now. And when we look at 
seasonality, right, we would normally expect to see a weak January and February, a relatively strong March and April, weakness into the summer, maybe a little bit flat, and then we move higher in the fourth quarter. We don't use it to predict, because you can't use that to predict. We just use it to take notice. Just take notice of the environment. Another way to look at this is the lower pain is the S&P 500. And this is us observing what is the seasonality. Are we behaving seasonal patterns or not? So for example, January and February, kind of understood that the market tends to be weak in this type of environment. It was weak. March tends to be strong. It was strong. April tends to be strong. Oh, wait. Interesting. April is weak when it normally is strong. Mm. That's when you perk up and say, okay, the potential for this year to be even wor worse or weaker than prior years is on the table. Then when weakness shows up in May and June, weakness in May and June, now we're looking for what does it look like into August and September. We think we follow the seasonal pattern. We see a nice what we call a relief rally, right? When stocks, after stocks have gone down 20 to 40% and they go up 10%, that's why they call it a relief rally, because that feels amazing. Oh, it just went out. Okay, good. It's not the end of the world. You know, it's relief. We think we get that. Now, price is only going to confirm. It's got to be above certain price levels to confirm. But are we up into August and September, and then we sell off going into dun, 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 the election? And then after that, we move higher? Possible. We continue to study this. Right now, our clue that this, this year could end up weaker than normal is that April period that was weak when it could have been strong and it wasn't. So why adaptive? Anybody can buy something, it's whether you can sell it. If you remember our three main objectives are big win, small win, small losses. Whenever we take a new position in a portfolio, those are our three main objectives. How do we maintain that objective? So what I like to go through is from the prior quarter, from the pri prior six months, some positions we've taken on for our clients and when we hit the sell button and how that impacted going forward. So in our ultra growth model, we hold individual stocks in a portion of that model. The rest of the models don't do that. So some of these are gonna be ultra growth specific. This is an individual stock, Cleveland Cliffs, entered it, had a 17% return, Subsequently, our data showed it wasn't just some magic bell that we should probably de-risk here. Since that period, since we sold it down 53%. So I, I forgot to put the tables on here so you could reference that, but that's one of those where you gotta get above 100% return to get back to even. Software, same thing, was showing some strength. We took on a position, gained almost nothing out of it, super small, but the sale was appropriate because it's minus 18% since then. This is Lithium Americas. This is a position that was taken, showing some strength, bought it uh, up 10%. Big red day and some signals that we use, uh, sold it minus 44% since then. This is uh, Smart Global. Uh, I believe we purchased this on one day and sold it on the next. Had a 5% loss, but it didn't turn into minus 26%. And so when you ask yourself, how are they able to be so aggressive with individual stocks, yet then avoid minus 34% like the average retail and only be at minus 17, it's because of this process. It's knowing when to sell. Uh, speaking of ongoing risk management, this is energy. Energy, interestingly enough, when you look at the S&P 500, is, was only about 2 to 3% of the index. But we were able to generate some alpha out of that. Alpha just means outperformance versus the index. Uh, we bought energy early in the year, entered, had about an 8% return. We exited here. Okay, and you'd say, oh, man, maybe you missed out on some upside. We were able to re-enter here and then exit again at minus 0.31, entered here, plus 3.4, and then subsequently uh, exited 
and that sector is down now minus 17 percent. If we had just bought and held it, we would be minusculely up from the original entry. That's why we like to use the sell button. It's like why we like to be adaptive. And it's, it's at this point, I'd like to invite Kevin Ferrari to come up. Oh, one, one question. You can keep coming up. In this example, uh, what, what was the final plus amount? Uh, I can get that for you. Oh. Um, I'm assume, I, I don't want to assume, but if I just tally those, you know, if I'm 9.2 and plus another 3, so I'm around 12 something, that's probably around 12% net. So the reason why... Kevin's coming up. He's going to talk to us a little bit about the U.S. dollar. Uh, as Paul mentioned, um, Kevin is a, a rising star. He's got a Series 65. He just took his CMT3 examination, waiting for the results. Yeah, about another two or three weeks. Two or three weeks. The hard part about that is exams one and two. Now is when you're getting whether you passed or not, and now he's got to sit here and wait for the results. But you can also thank him for all the uh, accurately executed trades. He sends the trades through for us. Uh, and that's his baby, and he does a tremendous job. So with that, please welcome Kevin Ferrari. So actually, when Paul was uh, bringing up, we got a wedding coming up, we just bought a house. Um, it's actually pretty fitting that I get to talk about the dollar because I feel like for the past six, seven months, all I've been doing is handing out dollars and not really getting too many. So this is uh, kind of perfect. Um, but how many people kind of keep track of like the mainstream media? Have anybody really heard too many people talking about the dollar much? I mean, I don't think I really hear about it. No. Which, Mostly inflation, right? I think it's probably the big talking point. So that's probably one of the more interesting things because I think this has probably been one of the bigger developments over kind of the past 12 months is really just the performance of the dollar. Um, so what this is, this is the dollar index. So basically it's the U.S. dollar weighted against other major currencies. Um, the top three we'll look at individually. It's the euro, the yen, and then the pound. So this index, basically since the last time um, we met back in April, um, down here kind of hit prior support, and really it's been doing nothing but rise since then. Um, and it's been a pretty dramatic rise at that, um, which is why it's so surprising that you haven't really heard the mainstream media talk about this more, um, just the fact that the dollar's been performing so well. Um, and when you look at it against these individual currencies, because you know currencies they're often talked about in pairs, right? So it's always one currency to the other. So in this case, it's the dollar to the euro. Um, you can see it looks quite a lot like that index. Um, same way for the past 12 months, been performing well, pearl codes, um, kind of the summer of this year, early June, um, and it's been doing really well. Same against the yen. Actually, the yen was probably the most dramatic rise here. Really, once you start getting into kind of the middle part of 2022, um, you can see that's probably about as close to the vertical as you can get. Um, it's been really um, cool to watch. A little bit of a retest, and it's continued on since then. And then kind of same story here against the pound, which is the third um, strongest weighting in DXY, the currency index. Here, not as strong. Um, you can see a little bit of a breakout. It's pulled back into kind of what was previously resistance, a little bit of support, so we'll see how that turns out here as time goes on. Um, but still, the dollar's been doing pretty well. Um, and when you look at it, this is kind of a currency matrix. Um, this is going back the last 12 months. The way you want to read this is the top row here is the main currency we're looking at. So in these past three examples, we're looking at the dollar to another foreign currency. So the dollar here is the main, oops, sorry, I'm um, count here, is the main currency, and this is how we've performed in relation to these other currencies. So you can see for the euro here, um, it would be up 50%. And you can see it beat every major currency here um, that's in this matrix. And it's been pretty dramatic as well. You can see there's some big numbers, 25% against the yen. Um, the yen was actually the weakest performer 
out of all of these currencies here, which you kind of saw that dramatic rise before. The second, I guess, best performer here is actually the Canadian dollar, um, which is down here towards the bottom, CAD. Um, the only other currency that the Canadian dollar couldn't beat was the US dollar. Um, now it's kind of followed by the Swiss franc there. So you can kind of just see one of the more common themes we've been noticing and we've actually participated in for clients has just been the strength of the dollar. Um, and one thing, Dave and I are actually talking about this um, before we get into the presentation. So if you look at the performance of the dollar to the yen, so it's the yen here, dollar up here. Um, where is it? So you see a 20% underperformance for the yen, but the outperformance is 25%. So if you look at the tables that we've been looking at before, um, draw down so what it would take to equal that in return, that actually matches up perfectly. You would need 25% return to get back to even for a 20% drawdown. So it's just kind of an interesting observation we've noticed there before. Um, if you were here last quarter um, when we talked last, or if you watched the YouTube video, one thing we talked about quite a bit was commodities. Um, and I know Dave's going to touch on this in a little bit. But one interesting thing we saw before, um, or actually the last quarter, is just the fact that commodities were outpacing the performance of the U.S. dollar, um, which we talked about before is not necessarily the case. Usually you would expect um, strong dollar, weaker commodities. Um, but you can kind of see here, at least more recently, it's actually hit prior um, support, current resistance, and that relationship is kind of turn back the way we would expect. Um, commodity, commodities now are um, not keeping pace with the dollar, um, which Dave will come up here and kind of look at individual commodities and kind of talk through why that is. Um, but part of it too is just what we touched on here, just how strong the dollar really has been. So for that, I'll turn it back over to Dave so I can think about how much money I've been spending on the house. And the wedding a little more. Okay. <laughs> Excellent job, Kevin. Uh, not the story that you get from the media. Normally when you think of inflation, you think of weaker dollar, and that's not really what we've sent. I'm not saying there isn't inflation, there is. But it's not because of the dollar. The dollar has been strong against everything, and as Kevin pointed out, and actually was his original observation on our team, that commodity strength in the face of dollar strength is something to be noted. I'd like to talk a little bit about commodities versus what's going on in Russia and Ukraine. And I should also point out at this time, uh, Cade and maybe a couple of his teammates are gonna walk around, and if you have questions, make sure you get them down on the note cards now, because he's gonna collect them so that we have them in time for the Q&A portion of the um, session. So if you were to think about, oh, you know, Ukraine being one of the, I believe, top five producers of wheat, uh, it's a main area that natural gas gets transported through, oil gets transported through on the way to, to uh, Europe, we would think that commodities would rip higher after an invasion of Ukraine, and that's at least the way the media has portrayed it. And I'm here to tell you that the media is wrong once again. The red line, the vertical line, represents when we heard news that Russia was crossing over the border and started doing airstrikes and uh, invading Ukraine. The black horizontal dash line represents the price of whatever we're looking at and where it is today. So most of these initially had a thrust higher. You know, there was a thought that agriculture was going to get really expensive uh, because of the invasion of Ukraine. It may still yet. And it has, obviously, if you've gone to the store, things have gotten expensive. But when we're just talking about the raw material, corn is now below, or just a little bit above where it was when Russia invaded Ukraine. Wheat, again, Ukraine being a major wheat producer, wheat's actually below that level. Cotton, same thing. We see that below where we were in the Russian invasion. Soybeans, same thing, you get the story. Oil, on the other hand, still holding up. 
I would say it's cooled off. This is a, a rather decent correction from 40 bucks down to 30. Uh, you know, if you do the math on that, that's not just pennies. And so oil is cooled off, but it's definitely still above where it was <coughs> pre-invasion. Gasoline, same thing we see at the pump. Now we've come off, at least here in Wisconsin, Wisconsin we've come off the five handle, right? We're no longer paying five bucks. I was just having a conversation with someone else. Man, if it gets to three, everyone's going to feel amazing. And then what if they just keep it at three? I don't know. Not sure that that makes sense, much sense to me. In fact, what I'm about to put on here, I only bring it up because I don't care whether you're a Democrat, Republican, purple, green, white, whatever. I don't understand why we're saying we're taking oil out of the reserve to lower prices when prices have stayed high and we're sending it overseas. I've got a brother that serves in the military. I think this is a problem. This is a strategic reserve for us, not for someone else. So that's about, I, I really, and it's really not a political statement. It's, this, this is lunacy to me. That you would somehow empty the reserve, saying you're trying to help prices, and then ship it overseas? No thank you. What happens when that's at zero? And then we end up in war, you got nothing. I don't know if people know this, but Humvees and tanks run on diesel and gas. So I have a problem with it. I wanted to highlight it because I have a major problem with it. I think that's a, I don't care what, like I said, it's not a political statement. I want to be very careful. If it were a Republican doing it, it's the dumbest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> Silver and gold. Um, this is one of those things where when you talk about inflation, where should you hide? It's always gold and silver. That's what they say. Gold and silver, gold and silver. Buy precious metals. Well, inflation has been going on since the beginning of this chart. Here's the, the other thing you buy silver and gold for is when, when there's a panic over uh, a global war. And here we have silver down since the invasion of Ukraine. Same thing with gold. We've seen a correction. <clears throat> So again, the reason why we study charts and we look at price is that we need to know when we're on the wrong side of the trade and we need to hit the sell button. So same thing, we participated in commodities. So some of these charts, you'll notice that they did appreciate at some point and they did help for portfolios at some point and they're, they're not something to be participated in currently. For example, we own some metals in mining. It's an ETF that represents, uh, you, you could be mining industrial metals, could be mining precious metals. Took an entry up 30%, was able to sell it before a minus 23% move. It's a good sale. Nickel, this is another example. The other thing you'll notice is the numbers are bigger with commodities. They just have bigger movements. It's just the way it is. Nickel up 62%. It was a great trade for us. We were able to sell it. Subsequently down uh, minus 39%. Again, you'll notice some math there that looks unique onto the table. When you look at it, what it takes to get back to even. Aluminum, uh, short, uh, short in duration trade, we only held it for a little while, up 9%, then sold it subsequently down 32%. With seasonality, when we look at commodities, so this is a the CRB index that represents, it's a commodity basket, so it's got oil and different things in it. Uh, that are commodity based. When we look at what they do each year, they tend to be strong into the first half and weak into the second half. And this has some importance because as I was talking before, we've seen stocks down and bonds down and for a little while commodities were up. So you had two asset classes down, one asset class up. We're heading into a period where do we see all three asset classes down with nowhere to hide but maybe the US dollar. We don't know. So now I'm going to have Kevin come back up. I believe I saw Cade with the cards. And I'll have Paul come up too to ask, some, ask us some questions. We'll shuffle through the cards and look to see if there's any good ones. Paul, I can look at them. Or if you just want to grab out of the grab bag, that'd be awesome. All right. So I've got a couple questions. Um, but I also have a lot here. And I'm trying to see if there's some major themes. For example, one of them, I already see a couple on iBox. So we'll get to those in a little bit. But, um, Kevin, why don't you just let people know how's the house hunting been going? How's 
you know, marriage planning going. You've been talking about handing out dollars. Maybe give us a sense for that, and we'll get into some of my prepared questions. Yeah, the, uh, the house has been good. We purchased a house uh, around the end of May, I think, and we weren't actually even looking. It just happened to see one that checked all the boxes and it happened to work out first offer. Um, so kind of unusual, I think, for what most people are seeing now. Um, I think it's a little over three acres, so we've been doing a lot of yard work. A um, couple hours on the mower each week, it's been good. It's a little hot. On the wedding planning, I'm definitely not management for that. Uh, I just gotta do what I'm told. So, and so far, I haven't been getting yelled at too much. So I can't be doing too bad, right? Nice. All right. Um, okay. This one's for either one of you. With stocks down, bonds down, commodities rolling over, where are we in the cycle, and how are we managing risk in this environment? I kind of teased this one with my last slide. So, uh, I felt the need to grab the mic. Uh, so this chart here to orientate you above the horizontal line is uh, business expansion below is business contraction and so you see that we have not flowed out of expansion down into contraction and this cycle is a perfectly normal economic cycle the reason why I was talking so much about we had been seeing stocks down bonds down and commodities up what stage is that? If stocks are down, bonds are down, but commodities are up, what stage is that on this chart? Stocks down, bonds down, commodities up. Stage five, right? Because we've got bonds down, stocks down, commodities up. If we see commodities continue to roll over, we are now in full on contraction mode. All things contracting, it can happen. What do we do to manage risk in that environment? Well, we view cash as a position too a lot of places uh, don't. They feel like they need to be fully invested the whole time. Uh, we have extremely high cash positions currently, and that's how we'll continue to be until we see a firming of, of any of the aforementioned that we can take uh, advantage of. Okay. All right. <clears throat> With inflation being the big topic of late, should we be buying precious metals like gold and silver to protect ourselves? That also aligns with a couple questions we had on gold. Um, yeah. yep. So if you would have asked me that question probably 10 years ago, I think I would probably agree with it, right? Um, I mean, just coming out of school, that's probably taught precious metals, inflationary environment. Um, that's a good way to hedge against inflation. Well, what we've been finding out is more recently in this current environment that it's not necessarily the case. Um, so here you're looking at gold individually. Um, kind of around the start of the year, you can see pretty dramatic rise, but it didn't sustain it. Um, ran into the resistance and actually has been um, moving downward since then, um, which you wouldn't expect as inflation continues to rise. Um, silver, kind of the same way, didn't quite have as dramatic rise, um, but also rolled over and actually broke down um, where gold has at least been um, holding its support. Oh, too far. So when you look at this chart here, so what this is, is a percentage performance chart, and it also charts the inflation right here. Um, so if you look at that, I'll try to shoot around Dave here. So this solid blue line here is the CPI index, the inflation rate, so it's right around 9%. Um, I think it's been the most recent report. Um, gold and silver are charted here, so you have gold kind of in the, its own color and silver below. You can kind of tell, and even just kind of put this together with the charts we showed before, um, silver really never had a chance to keep up with inflation, so that I mean, definitely would not have helped you out there. Gold, you had about maybe a two-month window where it did what you would expect, um, but once you saw in that first chart before it rolled over, it hasn't even been close to keeping up with inflation. Um, and what you'll actually see here, too, which we've been talking about more recently, DXY is the U.S. dollar index. Actually, that's been probably your best bet right now out of the three to just keep up with inflation has been actually holding U.S. dollar. So definitely not what you would expect like we've been talking about before. Um, interestingly enough, and this kind of goes back to a lot of these currency pairs, um, there's a lot of lines in this chart, but I guess kind of the gist of this is at the bottom of the chart here, 
what this is is gold priced in U.S. dollars. Um, and what you'll see from here is we have a bunch of other currencies here, gold priced in foreign currencies. Every other currency on this chart is above the U.S. dollar. Um, and actually, I'm trying to see where roughly the 9% mark is. I think it's right around in here. Basically above there in those foreign currencies, if you're in those countries are just transacting in those currencies. If you would have bought gold, um, like especially in the yen, for example, priced there, that actually would have done what you would expect um, and kind of hedged against inflation. But in U.S. dollars, like we mainly transact here, it just didn't get the job done. So just kind of an interesting development there. All right, I'm going to weave in a question from the crowd that relates to currencies that you were talking about. Is it better to have a strong dollar or a weak dollar? say in relation to anything? Uh, I guess other currencies. So just currencies in general? Yeah. Well, I guess that depends what asset class you're dealing with. I know we kind of mentioned this before. If you think in terms of generalities, like in commodities like we've been talking about, um, it's often thought strong dollar, bad for commodities. A lot of commodities transact in dollars. Um, so if you're in another country, and you have a stronger dollar to purchase dollars, to purchase the commodity, your own currency doesn't go as far. Um, so if you think about it in that aspect, um, if you have transaction currencies, you're outside the US, strong dollar, not so well. Um, I would think for us in dollars, I mean, really, I mean it's helping us now. Sure. Yeah, no, exactly. Yeah. Um, what's interesting is, for example, if you want to take a trip to Europe, now might be the time. Uh, we're in parity, so one dollar, one euro, whereas before it took a lot more <coughs> to buy a euro, so your trips to Europe were more expensive if you're looking to take a vacation. Uh, at the same time, and everything's relational. So when we talk about, for example, the S&P 500, what we're really talking about is the S&P 500 in dollars. When we look at this chart, for example, like Kevin said, yes, there's a lot of uh, squiggly lines, I get it. Um, the bottom line is the, is the dollar. The top one is the yen, and everything in between versus gold. What's this showing is that, yes, we have inflation of 9% in this country, but the inflation that's going on overseas is dramatically worse. Anybody see the news out of Sri Lanka? Okay, so they had a major upheaval there. A lot of that is currency related. People could not buy food because their currency wasn't the rupees weren't worth anything anymore. And so do we see that continue if inflation's worse elsewhere than it is here? So to answer that question, is a strong dollar good? It can be if you own it. And at the same time, sometimes you see strong dollar and equities fall. That's why you can't just marry positions and that's why you, you hold cash rather than holding equities. All right, that's good. So there's a, theme, a couple themes of, uh, okay, well, we're talking dollar, but what about this crypto thing, right? Is that gonna replace the dollar? What's the likelihood? Is that the future? Any truth they're gonna replace the dollar? I realize there's some speculation there, but maybe just talk about the digital aspect of uh, cryptocurrency versus like the dollar and what that kind of means for what you have to do on a day-to-day -day basis and then kind of what we're keeping our eye on as time progresses. Sure, we're, we're not afraid to own crypto with, with the tools we have available to us. We can't do it directly through any of the exchanges. And I will call crypto the Wild West. The Wild West has opportunity. It also has risk. Uh, some of the risks we're seeing is we're seeing entire hedge funds that are worth billions blow up that all they owned were, were crypto because we've had a major correction in, in crypto. So maybe someday they'll update that chart and it has crypto as an asset class in there or a currency class, and so now we're looking at stocks, bonds, crypto, commodities, or something like that. With the strong dollar, they've kind of operated similar to gold. They've had major corrections. I, I, can't, I believe the cor correction in Bitcoin was somewhere between 50 and 70%. So go ahead and go back to your chart and look at what it takes to get back to even. Um, we will happily participate in that, those again. What I will say is the, the recent strength, and when I say recent, <clears throat> the past week or so of strength in Bitcoin and Ethereum is not what we're seeing in the rest of the crypto space. And I will say that there's, there was an event that took place where 
uh, an exchange kind of evaporated. So imagine one day all of a sudden the New York Stock Exchange isn't working. Um, that, I'm being a little bit dramatic, but that kind of happened in, in the crypto world. And so we don't know the reverberations of that afterwards. So does it have a future? Yes, I would consider it like the dot-com bust. Plenty of those companies didn't make it, yet we still have Amazon today. So is there a future? Absolutely. What it looks like, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Um, I want to build up something. We talked bonds. I'm going to get to those. I got like four of these. Um, but you mentioned the New York Stock being closed. Uh, just an education question here. Are other stock exchanges around the world trading when the New York Stock Exchange is closed? Yes. I should have given them to you. Well, here, I got one. This, well, this is a good I think Justin's here now, right? Yeah, that starts getting to a lot of the... Um, time zone things, right, time differences. I don't know, we always have this running conversation about how time zones, for some reason, really confuse me. Um, for some reason, I really have a hard time keeping those straight, so that's, that's cool. Yeah, just second part stock, yeah, yeah. All right, uh, this is for Kevin. Hey, you guys uh, use the term resistance when it comes to charts. What does resistance mean? Yes. All right. This is good, especially going through the CMT courses here. It's perfect. Um, so, yeah, good. Well, and the trick with this is support and resistance can, former support can become resistance and vice versa. So it's, it's a little tricky there. Um, but in this chart of gold, the easiest way to think of it, um, if you go up to something, price goes up to something that's resisting it, it generally bounces back, right? So this top shaded area up here um, although it only touched it in kind of two or three points, would serve as resistance as price approaches it. Um, if it's held in the past, um, you basically, I don't want to say assume, but you're working under the assumption that you've seen resistance, um, more sellers show up there, and price are going backwards um, from there. So that's what resistance is, basically just a common price point where sellers overtake buyers and price comes back down and supports the opposite of that here, right, as you approach this level, you would expect buyers to come in, overwhelm sellers, and then price to at least hold or advance from there. And where it gets tricky is silver, oh, too far. Um, silver in this case supports right here, right, it failed. Now support becomes resistance as this eventually, or if it ever does, I guess, come back up, this now serves as resistance. So just kind of common areas you see buyers and sellers really kind of fighting it out. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so one of the questions I had um, talked about was, you know, we're protecting clients, should we be buying bonds? And then I have a number of questions here about specifically on I-bonds. What are they, how do they work, and do we actually think about them for our clients? Yes, we think about them, but um, I-bonds are bought directly from the Treasury. And so you can set that up online. Uh, they have different duration levels. I do believe there are certain I bonds out there that currently deliver like a 9% coupon, and that's why they're interesting. Um, so they're definitely something that could be considered for someone if they're, if they're appropriate for that person. Um, as far as being able to, to buy them on an open market, um, that's not something we're able to do, but I bonds are definitely a thing. They're paying a, paying a coupon, and you can do that directly. I believe it's treasurydirect.gov, I believe, is the website that you can do that through. That's not a recommendation. I'm just saying that that's, that's how that's done. Okay. Um, okay, we're coming up into the midterms. A few short months away. Um, what do we think is going to happen? And do we care? Yeah, so I, I mean, I, I might care personally, but I really don't care Market-wise, we're going to manage the same way. The way we put it is politics have no position size in our portfolios. Um, as you can see, different parties in power, and I know this is just a midterm, so this is not really reflecting uh, this is presidential, but really there's no difference. Now, you might see a shift in where the cash goes, so you may certain, see certain areas do better, but as far as overall, no party has a um, monopoly on market returns. So either way, it's fine. I do think if I may talk politically or personally that if Republicans
Republicans were to gain advantage, a fuller advantage in the Senate and regain the House, if you thought the last two years were crazy, it might get crazier. And I don't mean that as a slam on Republicans. It just opens the door for all sorts of investigations. And I tell people all the time, don't assume because the last two years were crazy that it can't get crazier. Okay, be the be the uh, self in other people's lives. Be prepared for that and have personal conversations. And focus on that instead. Anyway, don't watch political TV. Right, it gets you too fired up. Anyway. Yeah. Okay, so you, you talked about it, kind of looking yeah. forward. Oh, go ahead, sorry. Because this is like the coolest stat to me for some reason. But we talked about commodity performance last year. Um, so we think um, Democratic leadership. I think generally themes right, um, focus on the environment, things like that. People who have been here before probably know the answer to this, but what do you think the strongest performing commodity was last year? Any guesses? It's energy related. It's coal. I mean, not the cleanest form of energy, right? I never would have guessed that. Yeah, and it's blew most things out of the water, which is just crazy. So it's thing. Even like Dave said, you expect money depending on who's in charge kind of flow to different areas. I mean, even that doesn't necessarily have to hold true what you would expect, right? You always got to be open-minded. So. That's, a, that's a really good point to bring up, right? You have to be open-minded. So I guess looking forward, what are the, you know, if the bear market's going to continue, what are some pieces of evidence we're looking for? Um, so people kind of know what, hey, these are what we're keeping an eye on, and also being open to, hey, there might be some surprises like coal when we've been kind of shoved down our throats to get an electrical car. Well, I guess just in general, because we talked about this before, so if this continues, right, as you look at just the business cycle in general, transitioning, like Dave said, stage five, stage six, where you see more broad selling um, across bond stocks, commodities, basically everything where cash is kind of the only place um, to really be, that's kind of more what you would expect. Um, and generally, too, whether or not I mean, when you're expecting to pull out and go back into stage one to really restart that cycle, like this shows here, you would expect to see kind of some consolidation of bonds and eventually those to lead out of the bottom. Uh, and I know once two, generally, I know we've shown this before, um, there's a chart with the different sectors at the top. Um, and kind of once bonds lead and stocks start to come back up too, you usually start to see more kind of like your growthy stocks start to lead off the bottom too, which is what we'd be looking for. I think internally we talk a lot about bear markets have these legs to them. They have different, and, and I would say if there is, so we operate in theses, if there is an ongoing bear market, we could be heading seasonally into a period where we have a relief, which is the hard part of a bear market. It makes everybody feel good, things are okay, and then you roll back over. And what we haven't had yet is what we would call capitulation, and that's a very aggressive move down where everybody's selling hard, it doesn't matter, they're throwing the baby out with the bathwater. That's one thing we would be looking for if it were to continue. And we're, quite frankly, we could be marking the bottom within the last few days. I have no idea. A bottom is different from the bottom. Like I said, they never ring the bell. I don't know what those things are. The other thing is, if you could advance it one, uh, this one. So. We have all these all-star players in the index, such as Microsoft and Apple. So Microsoft and Apple make up 11% of the S&P 500. Think about that. That's like five times the entire energy sector, almost. So what happens at bull market tops, and then you go into this <coughs> long-term bear market, is the prior leaders become your laggards. So for example, as we went into 06, 07, 08, the, the final piece of that bull market leg. In the final two years, you saw financials get weak, your JP Morgans, your Berkshire Hathaways, and those had been the leaders on the way up. Energy, same thing, were the leaders on the way up in 07 and 08. And then all of a sudden, those rolled over, and that was it. That, and then we had that capitulation in fourth quarter, uh, 2008. That's what we would need for this to continue. Right now, Apple and Microsoft remain relatively strong versus the index. If we continue to see that happen, it's going to be very hard for the market to continue further down. But if it does happen, look out. 
All right, so we didn't get to every question, so I want to say thank you for submitting questions. Uh, there's a few more that maybe we can kind of get some content out later, or a lot of it aligns with some of the content we've done with the podcast or the weekly summaries, um, et cetera. So, but why don't we take some time to kind of wrap things up and um, kind of work toward a, a journey our, our time together. Absolutely. Uh, so yes, we'll, our team will gather those questions and try to get them out uh, within the, within the next, next two weeks here for you guys. Uh, and the reason why we do that is right now is the most important part of our day, one o'clock to three o'clock. This is our main job for our clients. We're gonna be heading out of here. Um, we won't take the convertible, but we're gonna go do our, our regular day job duties and, and manage risk for our clients. So we'll do our best to answer those questions. But final thoughts, it just goes back to, we're gonna manage risk for our clients. And if you like the information that's provided in here, I strongly encourage you to listen to our weekly podcast, because it's basically this on a weekly basis. It's great information, and I don't mean that to toot our horn or anything like that, it's just good information that if you have, if you, if you have questions about like, why is, this, why is this in my portfolio, or why is my why is portfolio performance like this? A lot of times you can listen to this and get that information, but then of course, if you want, you can always email us or reach out to us, and we can do it that way. Uh, for us, we always like to have a game plan, so we talked about ongoing bear market, what would we like to see? S&P 500, uh, we just cleared uh, an initial phase uh, yesterday that we'd like to see clear. In the end, until we're back above 4180, this market is suspect. NASDAQ 100, these are the big tech companies, Microsoft and Apple are in there. We wanna see that back above 13,000. Until we do that, again, market is suspect. This is the FTSE or FTSE uh, All World Index uh, this one actually goes back to 2007, and man, talk about nothing but heartburn. That thing has gone sideways for, think about if you own that. That's terrible. Um, but point being, if we're going to own international stocks, we'd like to see this index above 52 bucks. Emerging markets, I don't know how I did that, uh, or emerging markets similar looks similar to uh, FTSE, we like to see that above 45 and ultimately above 51 before international stocks really have any type of upward leg uh, thesis available. So in the end, like I said before, three main objectives of our process, big wins, small wins, small losses, when we take new positions, that's how we're able to have a minus 17% drawdown rather than a minus 34% drawdown. And we'll just continue to stay disciplined that way on behalf of our clients on a day-to-day -day basis. So again, if you guys need uh, more information or you're new to us, you're more than welcome to schedule an initial consultation with our planning team. It's free, they do a great job. Once you decide to step forward, they work on customizing a plan for you. Part of that is how we manage assets. And then you guys receive ongoing updates and enjoy your new financial confidence. It's really four easy steps. So with that, I appreciate it. Thank you, Kevin, you did a great job and thank you for being here and surviving a little bit of rain. Take care.